All right, let's take a look at uh, numbers 12 and 13. They go together. And we've got the hollow sphere rolls without slipping down the surface, the inclined surface. And we want to find both the acceleration and the magnitude of the static friction force. So uh, let's see here. First of all, I'll, let me just draw a picture here. Um, draw it like this. We've got a 30 degree angle and that's our, oh, well, that's our uh, hollow sphere. Uh, it's going to be rolling without slipping. Now, there's a couple of key words here, acceleration and the magnitude of the friction force. Um, and so that's right there, there's, that's a hint that we should probably at least use our, our force strategy. So let, let's get started with that. Let's, let's get started with our forces. And uh, what forces will we have here acting on our hollow sphere? We'll, of course, have gravity. And gravity pulls down everywhere in that sphere. Um, but uh, we can make an equivalent force right here in the center. So there's our force of gravity. We've got a normal force. And there, uh, in order for it to roll without slipping, uh, it's, there's, there's going to be some rotational acceleration. And neither of these forces here uh, create any torque about the, the uh, sphere center. So there has to be some force that's creating a torque. Um, and that's going to be uh, static friction in this case. It's not kinetic friction because even though it's moving, it's not sliding on the surface. And in order to cause the sphere to rotate this way, we can see that the static friction force has to be up the incline. And that's all of our forces. And so we can, let's draw in a little x, y axis here. We're going to use our tilted axis because we get that inclined surface. And uh, let's go ahead and um, our force strategy, you know, we get to use Newton's second law both in the x and y uh, directions. Let's start off with the x. I think that's all we're going to need here. Uh, and let's plug in our x components. We can see that the normal force is pointing directly in the positive y direction, so that doesn't have an x component. According to my picture and choice of axis here, the static friction force is directly in the negative x direction. And with gravity, I can see here that uh, it doesn't line up uh, exactly with either my x or y axis. So there's going to be components, uh, x and y components for the force of gravity. And so I'm going to change this just a little bit here. <clears throat> We need to think about these x and y components. The x component is parallel with the x-axis. The y component, this side here, is parallel with the y-axis. Um, and so also we know that this, if the incline is 30, there's also a 30 degree angle right there. Um, and so uh, we can see that the x component of our force of gravity, first of all, is in the positive x direction, the positive x-axis is closer to my force downward than the negative x-axis. So it does have a, a positive x component. And I'm going to take the magnitude of my force of gravity. And in order to find this piece down here of the triangle, I'm going to need to multiply by that sine of 30 because it's opposite from that angle. And I'll put at AX here. Actually, let's, let's just take a quick minute to simplify something. Um, it wants the magnitude of acceleration right here. Well, what do we have here? This is the x component of acceleration. The magnitude of acceleration we write like this. With that, it's not, there's not an x and y component. And in general, for a vector like acceleration, we could write this uh, as the sum of the x and y components squared to add those. Um, and, and Z, but we, we don't have that. Actually, we don't have a Y component either. This object as a whole is moving purely along that positive, along the X axis. There's no motion at all in the Y direction, and so this is just zero in our problem. And so for us, A equals the X component of acceleration. So, uh, well, I don't want to erase it. I'll tell you what, we're just going to write this. There only is an X component of acceleration. And so the magnitude of acceleration is the same thing here. All right, uh, maybe we can do one more simplification step. And maybe we could write that mg. And I guess, well, 
sure we'll write in times one half here. And so that is, that's about as far, well, that's as far as we can go here with just this equation. Um, and so let's see here, let's, let's take a moment to think about this. We've got both this translational motion and we've also got this uh, rotational motion going on. Now we studied the translational motion in more detail by using Newton's second law, and we're gonna to need to do something, um, we're gonna to need to use the equivalent for rotation. So often I'll call it the second law for rotation, and that looks, um, I didn't leave myself a lot of room, it looks something like this. All right, in this case we add up all the torques and relate that to its rotational acceleration. Now, um, in this example, we are, we are gonna wanna choose our axis point. In order to calculate our torques, we know that we need to choose an axis point. And my suggestion, certainly if an object is rotating about some point, um, to use that as your axis. So I'm gonna choose that uh, center point of the object. And that's, we're gonna calculate our torques about that point, and also our rotational inertia is gonna be about the sphere center. And, that makes both of those easier for us with that choice of axis. So let's calculate our torques. Actually, we can see two of them are, are uh, gonna be pretty relatively easy for us because given this axis point at the center, I can see that with my force of gravity, I'm gonna draw that line through the force arrow, I can see that the lever arm distance for the force of gravity is zero. Um, and similarly, with the normal force, it's also zero, that's not working. <clears throat> anyway, those two uh, forces are gonna have zero lever arm. All right, so uh, there's only one force that's creating a torque and that's our static friction force. And to get our lever arm distance, the shortest distance between the line that goes through the static friction force and the axis point, the shortest distance there is the radius of the sphere. Now, the radius of the sphere isn't given, and so we're just gonna call it R. And so we'll get something like this. The lever arm distance, right? Remember, torque, the magnitude of torque is lever arm times force, lever arm distance. So lever arm distance is the radius of the sphere. I'm just calling that R, the force of static friction. And now with our rotational inertia of a hollow sphere, um, and it, the mass is given, I think I'll just write M for now. Um, we can look up the rotational inertia for a hollow sphere and it will say uh, two-thirds mr squared. Now that's the rotational inertia through the sphere center, but that's perfect because that's where we've chosen our axis point. So this is going to be two-thirds, and I'll just write alpha here. All right, the, the mass we know, the radius, we, we made that up as we went along here. Now we can get a little bit of simplification because this, this radius is gonna cancel out one of those on the other side, but we're still, at this point, we're still a little stuck because it doesn't seem like I can simplify either of these, and I've got three unknowns and, and two equations, so I need one more piece of information. And all the problems, again, that we look at in this class that have this rotational motion and translational motion, they're gonna be related, right? Rolls without slipping down the incline or a string wrapped around a pulley or something like that. And so that means, uh, let me clear a little space here, we are going to use, we're gonna need to use one of these three equations. And I think it's pretty clear, we can see that the one we want is this last one, um, because in fact, I can see R, yeah, here's R times alpha right here. One R, R times alpha, and so that's equal to A. Let's go ahead and take that and plug it in right here, and so this will help us simplify quite a bit. Static friction force. Now I'm ready to uh, take this static, take this, and plug it in right here. Uh, and so what will we get? I'm going to plug that in here. And we can see that there's only one unknown left, and that's A, and so we should be able to solve. Actually, it also simplifies because 
we can divide through all the terms of the entire equation by m. Let's do that. And now we should be able to um, solve for a. I'm going to take this, I'm going to add 2 thirds a to both sides. I'll have 5 thirds a over here. Uh, and when I solve, let's see, I'm going to get 3g over 10. Uh, and we use g equals 10 meters per second squared on our exams here. So we just get, end up getting 3 meters per second squared. So that's the answer A. <clears throat> Actually, at this point, number 13 is going to be relatively easy for us uh, because uh, now that we've got A, 3 meters per second squared, we can actually just plug it into one of our other equations. And if we, this one looks pretty easy um, to find the magnitude of this static friction force. So the magnitude of the static friction force, here we are going to have to plug in the mass of our object, and in, we're, we're using all SI units here, so we don't have to worry about them. One kilogram and three meters per second squared. And so we can uh, see that that works out to be two, and our standard units are newtons. Also answer A.